This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. How do you feel about women's rights, Groucho Marx? I like either side of them, he replied. A child of five could understand this, said Groucho. So get me a child of five. Sometimes it seems that a sentence can semantically mean one thing and so be interpreted in one way, but is intended to mean something else. A central theme in the philosophy of language is working out what meaning means. What is it for a speaker or writer of a sentence to mean something by a sentence? Can I just read off the meaning of a sentence by the definition of the words I use and the order in which these words are placed? Or are the words just clues to what I mean? Is the meaning of a sentence dependent upon its context? Professor Stephen Neal is at the City University of New York. Stephen Neal, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you, Nigel. Good to be here. We're going to focus on the topic of meaning and interpretation. It would be quite useful to separate out those two. And what are they? What's meaning? What's interpretation? Yes. Well, this is one of the issues that's irked me a lot in a lot of contemporary philosophy of language. They're not separated It seems to me there's a metaphysical question, a constitutive question, of what determines the meaning of something? What makes it the case that somebody meant such and such when they were speaking? What makes it the case that this sentence means whatever it means? And then there's a very different question that's related, of course, how do we actually identify meaning? How do we work out? How do we ascertain what somebody means? And how do we work out what the sentence means? So that's really a question that's more on the epistemological side of things than the metaphysical side of things. So I uttered the words, the cat sat on the map which describes what happened last night in my house. And that has a meaning, which is a meaning presumably for me, what I meant by that. But interpretation is what somebody else does. They hear me utter those words or see that I wrote those words down, and then they try and work out what I meant. That's exactly right. And it's very important in this to distinguish what the sentence itself means and what you meant when you uttered that sentence on that occasion. There can be a gap. One way, you might just be implying something that you're not literally stating. So the classic case in the literature from Grice is the case of a letter of recommendation where you simply write, Smith has wonderful handwriting and he's always on time. Yours sincerely. And it's clear that what you mean goes well beyond anything you can get out of the words themselves. You've implied something that you didn't literally state. So there's an aspect of meaning that's quite different from what the meaning of the sentence itself is. And that's one part of what the person actually means by uttering a sentence. And then, as you say, the next thing to be looked at here is how people then try and work out what it is people mean. And in that sort of case, where there's this obvious gap between what the meaning of the sentence is and what the person's trying to get across, clearly a great deal of work is going on. And yet, we manage to do this unconsciously, automatically, quickly, all day long, without any reflection. That's a great mystery. So when somebody does utter some words, where does the meaning come from? It comes from the mental states of the person using the words. The intentions of the speaker. A certain very sophisticated, higher order type of intention. It's an intention to get something across and to be perceived by the other person as being trying to get something across. You intend this person to recognize your intention to communicate to them. It's a very sophisticated process, which we somehow manage to do without really reflecting on it all day long. Could you give an example of that? Yeah. So, first of all, there's the case I gave a minute ago about the gap between what the sentence means and what the person actually gets across using that sentence. But there are much tamer examples where there are gaps to be filled. If I'm looking around in an auditorium and I say, everybody looks very tired, It's clear that I'm not trying to communicate that everybody in the world looks rather tired, right? I mean something like everyone in the room, everyone at the lecture, everyone in the auditorium. And in some sense, it doesn't matter how I fill that out. There's not really much of a choice between those three. Everyone in the auditorium, everyone in the room, everyone in the lecture. It doesn't really matter, up to a point. Yet people manage to fill in. They paper over the gap, as you might put it, without really much reflection at all. Some people might... I think you think naively, believe that what determines the meaning of words is something like a dictionary definition, an understanding of how language works syntactically, so that when you utter certain words, they just have a fixed public meaning. And that's right, but we mustn't overplay the cards here. The linguistic meanings of the individual words somehow conspire with with each other in virtue of their syntactic arrangement to create these structured meanings. 
Now, exactly what somebody manages to state with a sentence with a particular meaning is something that goes beyond this. Suppose you come into my house and you look very thirsty and everything, and I say hi, and I open the fridge, and I say, take anything you like. Now, something's gone very wrong if you walk off with the fridge, or the fridge door, the thermostat. I didn't tell you those weren't some of the options, some of the things on the list, yet you just knew that was not really the sort of thing you were intended to take. So there's a case where the sentence itself, take anything you like, has a clear meaning, but you're imposing, as the interpreter, you're immediately imposing some constraints on how far that stretches. What makes it the case that you've got the right constraints? The ones the speaker intended, more or less. That's why I say something has gone wrong if you walk off with the fridge door, because you've done something which doesn't comport with what I intended. Actually, lots of jokes are based on that kind of literal misunderstanding where somebody takes the words as if they had this fixed meaning and, and interprets them without taking the context into account. And it's exactly why we recognise these as jokes, because we automatically do. And that's what makes the joke actually work. We, as natural, normal interpreters, don't do that. We're built to go after the meaning that the speaker intended. In a conversation like the one we're having... There are all kinds of non-verbal aspects of communication, so the tone of voice, the speed at which somebody speaks, hand gestures. You can't see those if you're listening to us, but, you know, I'm waving my hands around. I may be communicating all kinds of things. But when it comes to the written word, it strikes me that a lot of the cues about a speaker's intentions, a writer's intentions, are just not present. That's exactly right. And that's what makes interpreting written text so much more difficult, especially when the the writer isn't around to consult. Even if the writer were around to consult, you still can't get inside the writer's head any more than you can get inside a speaker's head. But when you've got a document which has been produced by, say, a group of people 50 or 60 years ago, a law or something like that, those sorts of cues aren't around, and you've got to get your cues from elsewhere. What's true in the normal day-to-day situation is the speaker produces some words... And that's just a very central part of the story, part of the evidence that you use for identifying what they mean. As you say, there are hand gestures, all sorts of other things going on, what was recently said, the previous sentence, and so on. All of this stuff, you're allowed to use anything you like to work out what somebody said. Humpty Dumpty in Alice Through the Looking Glass famously said that he could use words to mean anything he liked, and that clearly wasn't true. Right, and the charge of Humpty Dumptyism, this is found all over the place in literary theory, in legal theory, and in the philosophy of language. And I think it's been dealt with pretty effectively within the intentional framework once you understand just how complex the sorts of intentions that you have when you communicate are and the sorts of constraints that there are on forming intentions, including communicative intentions. So just in general, and this is an old point, you can't intend what you believe to be impossible. So that's why I can't intend to swim to Australia tonight, because I know I can't. Similarly, I couldn't use the sentence, Paris is the capital of France, and mean by it, I'm going to swim to Australia, or even that I'm going to Australia, or that Argentina is in South America. Of course, not everyone agrees with you. Presumably some people will put much more stress on the public meaning of particularly written words, so that the interpretation that you give is based on what the text in front of you, not on the biography of the writer. Yeah. Of course, this has been a huge issue in legal theory, where much of the time the author or authors, the whole of the Congress or Parliament or whatever, they're not around. And even if they were, they'd squabble. They wouldn't give you a coherent answer between them if you asked them. So what do you do then? And there's a very natural thing people have thought is, well, you look at the text itself. You just interpret the text and you don't think about the people who wrote it. You just look at it and do it. Unfortunately, that's just a naive picture of what you're capable of doing. We're not built like that. When we interpret a sentence that's been produced by somebody, we interpret it as something written by somebody with a specific purpose in mind, even if we consciously try and say, well, I'm not going to focus on the specific purposes the person had in mind, you still can't get away from the fact that this sentence was produced by some person or group of people because it was deemed to be the sentence that would do the trick here, that this would get across the meaning. We're just naturally built to try and recover meaning. So this idea of somehow approaching the text in this utterly decontextualized, depersonalized way, it really is a myth. It's one of the deep myths about the notion of meaning.
I know you're in the unusual position as a philosopher of language of having been involved in legal cases that turns on the meaning of words. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, in, in a sense, it's a natural outgrowth of the sorts of work that's been going on in the philosophy of language for the last 20 or 30 years. I like to call it applied philosophy of language because that's really what it is, just applications of things that have become second nature to us to cases outside philosophy itself where the sort of reflections that we've had on language can make a real difference. So this whole business about the way context actually affects meaning is, is a classic example of this. And what you'll find if you look at, at legal argumentation is that people mean very, very different things by the word context, for example. Sometimes they mean the next word. Sometimes they mean other things in the sentence. Sometimes they mean the purpose of the statute. Sometimes they mean what they know to be the intentions of somebody who was involved framing it. There's a, a famous example, Smith versus the United States. Angus Smith traded, I believe it was two ounces of cocaine, for a semi-automatic Mac-10 gun. And he was found guilty of a drug trafficking offence. But he was also found guilty of having used a firearm in a drug trafficking offence. And that got him 30 years. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. It ping-ponged through the various levels of court. It got all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, where the decision was upheld. I think it was six votes to three. And both sides talked quite a lot of nonsense and unfortunately, the worst of the two, one, the people who argued that he did not use a gun in a drug trafficking offence in the sense in question were implicitly adverting to the intentions of the people who passed the legislation. But they, in particular Justice Scalia, precluded themselves from actually saying that because they've taken such a stance against intentionalism, against the search for intentions in legal interpretation. So they come up with some very twisted type of rhetoric to try and get that conclusion, but without mentioning the dreaded word intention. So this whole case turned on the meaning of the word use. So if you use a gun in a drug trafficking offence, your tariff is immediately much, much higher. But the intentions of the people who drafted that legislation clearly weren't that you can't use it effectively as money in a transaction. They meant you mustn't threaten people, you mustn't shoot a gun at somebody or fire it over someone's head. That's right. But the um, problem now, of course, is what did they mean by use a firearm? Shooting, pointing it at somebody, threatening, perhaps even hitting somebody with it? What Justice O'Connor argued, that if it was used in a way that was material to the execution of the crime, that's what counts. But it's very easy to imagine cases where still it seems rather strained. So one of the examples that was discussed, for example, is, well, what if you used it to scratch your nose in the middle of the drug trafficking offence? To which the reply was, well, it depends whether this was simply to relieve an itch or whether, say, it was a signal to somebody else in involved in the offence. That would make a difference. So while I agree, there are some constraints implicit in this particular use of use a firearm. It's actually quite difficult to say precisely what they are. OK, but it could be said that the way language is used specifically in a legal context is that people draft legislation for a completely literal reading of the text. So it's a special area of language use. That's right. And if we deny that, then we're essentially undermining the very idea of law. The law has to be available to people in the public realm that you, in principle, know what laws you are subject to. Otherwise, the whole idea becomes a bit of a mockery. And to that extent, written texts, particularly in the legal setting, are different from ordinary speech. Now, I don't think we have a good story yet of precisely what that amounts to, given that we are going to treat this still as the product of an intentional use of language. One interpretation of this specific case is that it was just a badly drafted law. That's the weakness. It wasn't that... It turns on the meaning of use. It's just it was an imperfectly created law. Yes, all laws are. There's always what loosely we can call ambiguity, vagueness, various ways in which things are just not nailed down precisely by the meanings of the words. But that's always the case. Now, the reason that legal texts, laws, are so, you know, pages and pages and pages to say, thou shalt not steal, to get it right takes a lot of words to do this. And there is a sort of dream that somehow if you just use enough words and get enough people working on this for enough time, we'll nail it down so there'll never be any slippage. And this is rubbish. There's always going to be slippage. You try to minimise it. And that's why legal prose is so 
convoluted and why the statement of a law is so long. There's always interpretation. When you hear a sentence, when you read a sentence, you're not simply involved in constructing the meaning of the sentence on the basis of the meanings of the words and the syntactic structure. There's a lot more you're doing as well. You're engaged in this process of interpretation, of working out what the producer of that sentence on that occasion meant, what they were stating with that particular sentence. So there will always be interpretation. Stephen Neal, thank you for making your intention so clear. <laughs> thank you very much, Nigel. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk. Mm.